Hello, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's webcast, New Tools for Public Participation, Possibilities and Pitfalls. I have a few short announcements before we get started with today's webcast. The slides for today's webcast are available at the utah-apa.org website in the webcast archive. You can go ahead and download those slides for today's session. For help during the webcast, you can type a question in the question box on your GoToWebinar menu or call the 1-800 number for tech support at GoToWebinar. We will be collecting the questions that you have regarding the content of today's session and we'll be reviewing those in the question and answer period of today's session. We do have a new webcast address for uh, the webcast series. It has changed to utah-apa.org backslash webcast. We just dropped the HTM on it, so if you have trouble finding any of our upcoming events, uh, just know that we have a slight webcast address change. We have a wide range of participating chapters, divisions, and universities that are part of today's session, are part of our webcast series. Today's sponsor is the Technology Division of APA. We have a series of upcoming webcasts that are located uh, over the next quarter. I've listed a number of those here, including today's session for new tools for public participation. Our April 8th session is approved for ethics CM credit if you're looking for that. We have events on campus planning, uh, using GIS, improving client consultant relations, and new ideas for bike-friendly communities. Um, so for those of you that are interested, I just got a question that popped in. You can just go to utah-apa.org and click the past webcast button and that will take you to where today's slides are for today's session. We do have a brand new webcast that's been added to the series that will be sponsored by the Technology Division. It's the Introduction to the h and It's the Housing and Transportation Affordability Index and Applications and Planning. Many of you may have heard about this. It's from the Center for Neighborhood Technology. And so you may be interested in joining that session. It will be on June 24th. To log your CM credits for today's event, you'll go to planning.org backslash CM. You'll select today's date, Friday, April 1st, and select the item, New Tools for Public. We do have a uh, video recording that will be made available of today's webinar at utah-apa.org slash past webcast, and that will be posted by the end of the day today. We are hosting a uh, Twitter feed for today's session. You can access that by going to Twitter and typing in the hashtag APA social media and that will pull up our tweets throughout today's session. Our speakers will be tweeting links and key ideas throughout today's session so you can feel free to join us on Twitter as well. Today's session is on the use of public participation in planning, and we have uh, two speakers with us today. I'll be one of your speakers. I'm Jennifer Evans Cowley, and I'm the chair of the Technology Division of APA and the head of city and regional planning at Ohio State University. I also coordinate this webcast series that you're participating in, and my passion centers around how technology can be used to engage the public in planning for more sustainable cities. I have a BS and a master's in urban planning from Texas A&M, a master's in public administration from the University of North Texas, and a PhD in urban and regional science from Texas A&M. My partner in today's session is Rob Goodspeed, who's a PhD student at MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning. His dissertation research is evaluating the role of planning support systems for participation in local land use planning. He recently completed an open government strategy for the city of Boston, and before returning to school, he was an analyst with the Metro Area Planning Council. He holds his bachelor's degree from Michigan and his master's in community planning planning from the University of Maryland. Now today's session is an advanced session on the use of social media in public participation, focusing on the possibilities and pitfalls. You've all heard about different organizations using social media, and most of the work out there has been good case studies showing you what planners have done. Today we're digging deeper, looking from a researcher's perspective at how one city has experimented with social media. I'll be focusing on a social media experiment in Austin's transportation planning with a focus on how we as planners can analyze participation data, 
And Rob will be looking at Austin's use of social media in its comprehensive planning effort, examining how open, representative, and relevant the public input is that is received through social media. In both cases, we recognize that online participation is just one piece of larger participation strategies. And we fully recognize and support the idea that social media is just one tool that should be used as part of a suite of tools used in the planning process. Now, because this is an advanced session, we expect everyone participating has a basic understanding of how social media works and the basic terminology. This slide just presents a few of the terms that we're going to be discussing throughout today's session. But to get started, we want to go ahead and have a quick poll. Uh, first of all, we want to know, um, all right, which of the following um, social media tools are you personally using? So we're using Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. You can answer as many of them as you would like. And we'll give everybody a second to respond to that. You have about 10 more seconds to get your vote in. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now. All right, and so what we see is that 68% of you are using Facebook, about 20% are using Twitter, 58% are on LinkedIn, and 45% are on YouTube. I did a social media session with uh, folks just like yourself last year, and this, these numbers are dramatically up from the year before. Um, so we want to ask you another question. And I, I just have to pull up the next poll. But we're going to be asking you about whether or not you're using social media tools professionally when you're working on planning projects. OK, so how many of you are using Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or YouTube in your professional planning projects? We'll give everybody a little bit of time to type get your votes in all right so I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and what we see is that about 30% of you are using uh, Facebook in your projects, 15% are using Twitter, 14% LinkedIn, and 8% are using YouTube. So that's great. We've got some people that are out there experimenting in a professional context. Hopefully Rob and I can share some great information with you today about uh, what we're doing and, and what we've observed in participatory processes in Austin. Okay, so that's the end of our polls for now. At this point, I'm going to move on and get started with the, the content of today's session. So my portion of today's presentation centers on the use of microblogs in promoting public engagement. And so when I say microblogs, I'm referring to all those status postings, either on Facebook or Twitter or other outlets, uh, that users post to share information. So for example, I could tweet right now that I'm giving a presentation on the use of microblogs in social media. Now when I use the term micro-participation, simply put, it's just participation that is at our convenience. We're all time constrained and sometimes all we have is a minute or two to give. So how would we as planners best utilize that one or two minutes that people can give us? Now my recent research has been centered around Austin's strategic mobility plan and their efforts to try to engage using social media. Now Austin's a place that's known for innovation and experimentation in technology and so it seems like a great case study for us to look at, both Rob and myself. In the business community, they had a survey in Austin that asked about the barriers to economic development. And the number one barrier that uh, those respondents came up with was traffic. The traffic was the number one barrier to economic development. I recently saw a study that rated Austin as one of the most trafficked places there is in the United States. So this was a really critical issue that the city of Austin was looking at. So they 
put together this Austin Strategic Mobility Plan, and the intention was for it to be multimodal to guide investment. And this represented a fairly fundamental shift in the thinking around transportation to focus on all modes rather than single or one or two modes. And the city had been experimenting with social media and other planning processes and wanted to try it using this planning process as well. So back in 2009, the Texas Citizens Fund invited me to serve as an external evaluator on a Federal Transit Administration proposal. Their goal was to try to use social media to engage the public in planning. And at first I thought, okay, everyone's trying this, so what are you doing that's new? We've all seen the build it and they can come approach. We've also seen the build the social media and presence and push information out approach. And there's nothing wrong with these approaches, but they've generally had limited success. So I was pleasantly surprised surprised that their approach did indeed represent an innovative approach to engagement. Their innovation was simple in concept. Build a system that would constantly scan Twitter, Facebook, and blogs looking for anyone posting about transportation issues in Austin. And once they found a conversation, they would attempt to engage that microblogger in a conversation and dialogue around key topics in the Austin Strategic Mobility Plan. And so from this, the idea of SNAP was born, the Social Networking and Planning Project. So here's how it works. First of all, people can share their thoughts on Twitter. They might type something like, I don't feel my, safe riding my bike to work. Or they can post on Facebook, my commute down Mopac takes me more than 40 minutes. And what happens is Snap is sweeping the internet every 15 minutes, searching for new microblogs and posts, and then it pulls those onto their live website at snapatx.org. And the rest of the world can see the microblogs on transportation in Austin in near real time on their website. So then SNAP captures all these microblogs related to Austin and transportation based on keywords into a master database. And then SNAP reviewed these thousands of blogs and analyzed them to, and aggregated themes and trends on a monthly basis using some experimental and analytic methods. Then each month the analysis was sent over to the city of Austin to help support the development of the strategic mobility plan and the preparation for a bond election. Now, people were able to friend, follow, or comment using the social media applications, and, and they were welcome to do this, but the intent was really to find people who were already talking about these issues, and then to just try to engage them in a conversation. So building an ongoing rapport was important, but more important was finding those people to start with. And they ran this project between April and October of 2010, so it was, it was about a six-month period that they were doing this engagement process. And the goal of all this was to engage the public in helping to solve Austin's pressing transportation challenges using social media platforms. So here's an example from the SNAP website. And the way it's set up is they have this database of all the commentary that's coming in every 15 minutes, and we can sort it by social media outlet and by uh, mode. So if we want to look at buses and rail, we could look at that only for Twitter or Facebook or whatever assortment we wanted. And so what we can see is in this list we have one tweet that says, everyone in Austin start riding the metro rail. The more that ride, the more they will expand it. So this would be an example of something we'd be interested in and that we would want to facilitate and try to engage in a conversation around. Now, you have to go in expecting that if you're intruding on people's personal conversations that they may or may not realize are being shared with the rest of the world that you're going to come across some interesting things. So in this case, I'll admit most of the appeal of cycling is wearing nothing but multicolor underwear in public like some sort of superhero. So you have to consider as a planner, what's the starting point if you walked into that and how do you, what kind of question might you ask? Do you start with something like, do you bike or uh, to work for re or for recreation? I'm not sure how you would start that dialogue, but the planner needs to be thinking about that. If this is what's going to be posted, how do we respond and then engage them in a conversation about strategic planning? And SNAP responds to all of these thousands of microblogs. In this little sheet, what we see is that between 12.55 p.m. and 1.14 a.m., a SNAP facilitator had a conversation with Cat's Head 42. And I'm going to talk more about this specific conversation a little bit later. But the whole point is that in this 15, 20-minute period, they, the facilitator was able to engage in a conversation about challenges in riding the bus. And so we'll talk more about the content related to that. Now, SNAP also made pushes to stimulate conversations. For example, in five words or less, how would you describe Austin? The answer, 
overcrowded and congested. Now some planners might be worried about the responses that you might get, but if you want people to participate, you have to expect that the good is going to come with the bad. For example, in the next push they ha said, what's your vision of a perfect Austin? And they talk about the comprehensive planning process, which Rob is going to talk more about in a moment. And just ask people, what do you think about the vision statement? Now, unfortunately, Michael Cosper said their vision statement is way too long and convoluted to be a vision statement and that the entire process has been unprofessional kindergarten level exercise. Now, that may not be the kind of input that you want to receive, but you have to expect that there are going to be people who may not support everything that you're talking about. One of the other things that they tried to do was to have micro surveys. These were quick two minute surveys that were limited to just two or three questions, trying to get people to help in prioritizing critical um, issues. This is one that took place in May of last year. They asked two quick questions. For a potential 2010 bond, where should the investments be made? They gave them $100. And what people said is the largest portion of money should be invested in regionally significant projects improving congestion points. So we had 600 people that responded to this micro survey, just giving quick feedback to the city on where they saw their priorities. The second question was about priorities in terms of overall, what are they thinking, and people would put more emphasis on fixing some of the backlog of uh, gaps for roads, sidewalks, bicycling, and accomplishing a few larger iconic projects. Now the demographics in the survey were asked, we just asked them whether or not they were male or female, and uh, their age, and what we see is that we have uh, slightly more males than females, and that we have an older population that has responded to this survey. Additionally, SNAP would be pushing out things. They might push out as a tweet, exploring two alternatives, better bus versus urban rail. Which do you think suits Austin's needs better? And what would happen is they would then link that to this blog post that goes into more detail about what a better bus technology is. And they've translated the technical details that are located in the Central Austin Transit Study, and they provide a link to that more detailed study in digestible ways. So we're trying to push out information to get people better educated about uh, the strategic mobility choices that are facing the region. They also provided transportation links so people who wanted to spend more than what micro participation may allow, they could look at the full transportation bond project proposal, look at the full strategic mobility plan and other documents that are out there. But the bigger question that I want to present is how do we actually analyze all of this micro-participation data? That's great that we can get all these people to participate, but then what do we do with these micro-blogs and, and the micro-conversations that are happening? So there were more than 49,000 micro-blogs that were collected. Now you think about that, 49,000 text statements. How are you going to begin to understand that and create meaning from that that can influence decision-making? And what SNAP did is they organized the microblogs. So of the 49,000, 11,500 of them were relevant. So what would happen is that people would be saying, I'm on the bus with my friend Austin. That is not a relevant tweet. It's something that would be captured in the scraping because it contains a transportation word and the word Austin, but it's not referring to Austin as a place. So those had to be excluded. They found 11,500 that were relevant. Of those, 8,300 were from microbloggers, so just members of the public that are writing about issues of transportation in Austin. A thousand of them were from media sources. 2,100 came from SNAP itself, 1,000 of those facilitating conversations, and another 1,100 that were pushing information out to encourage uh, people to engage in conversation. So what happened is they coded the 8,300 microblogs that came from the public themselves by type, theme, topic, and sentiment, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. And then I conducted a more detailed sentiment analysis, uh, engaged in a, a dialogue content analysis, and then looked at rates of participation. And I'll be talking about those analysis techniques in a moment. So how do we think about what is a microblog? How do we think about how we would create a typology? So SNAP decided that they should have three different types, a sharing, an engaging, and an analy analyzing. So sharing one, listen up UT students, City of Austin is cracking down on e-bus riders that become unruly. That's an example of somebody that's trying to share information with others. An engaging example is a $7 fare 
for a 24-hour bus pass. How much is it in Austin exactly? So what they're trying to do is engage with others who are out there in these social media forums and encourage them to respond. And then an analyzing example is, is transit. Austin Red Line versus Twin Cities Hiawatha. I like both. Only similarity, a single route. Then what we did is organize them around theme and topic. The themes were related to the Austin Strategic Mobility Plan, such as economic development, regional integration, safety, so they had these major themes. And then what we would look at is what were people actually saying in that comment. So if we take this example, where do most of Austin's bicycle motorist collisions occur? Check that, this map. The two topics would be bicycle and automobile, and the theme would be safety, because that's the focus of this message. So it provided a way to organize these um, different microblogs so that we can understand what are the issues that people are talking about. Then SNAP conducted a simple sentiment analysis. They just reviewed each microblog to determine which ones were positive or negative. So if somebody posted traffic sucks, that would be an example of negative. It was a beautiful day for my bike commute would be an example of a positive sentiment. Then what I did is I went in and I conducted a more detailed sentiment analysis. And I used it, the uh, linguistic inquiry and word count analysis software. It's a text analysis software. It's about $80, so it, it's an affordable price. And what it does is it allows you to look in more detail at the sentiment that's being expressed. It assesses emotional, cognitive, and structural components of text using a psychometrically validated internal dictionary. The LIWC calculates the degree to which a text sample contains words belonging to empirically defined psychological and structural categories, and then it calculates the relative frequency with which words related to the psychological dimension occur. And this software has been used in a study of Twitter during German elections, and when I had read that article I thought this was ideal for analyzing public participation in this context, and so wanted to experiment with that. So if we look at the results, this is just the simple sentiment analysis. Uh, this is what SNAP did. So what they would do is, is here we just took mode. So if we looked at all of those 8,300 tweets and uh, microblogs that came in and then looked at whether or not they expressed positive or negative sentiment, what we see is that bicycling is associated with positive sentiment, while automobiles and buses are 50-50 or slightly negative. So that tells one picture. Okay, people like biking and walking, and maybe they're somewhat negative about automobiles and buses. But if we take it to the next level using the LIWC software, we see different um, things that emerge. And unfortunately, I'm not sure why Series 4 shows up, but that is the automobiles. And so what, if we look at this in more depth, what we see is that when people are talking about bicycling, they're talking about it in the context of leisure. So that means that when they're talking about bicycling, they're associating with a leisure activity. They're not necessarily associating it with commuting. Okay, so that's important to know. Whereas when we look at automobiles and buses, they're talking about that in real time and space. So it means that people are tweeting about their difficulties with automobiles and buses while they're having this experience. So they may be stuck in traffic and tweeting about that. Now that may not be safe, but that's what's happening is that people are talking about it in real time and space. So then it tells us maybe we should reconfigure this analysis to then separate the text comments that are being said about commuting and then look at mode choice in commuting behavior and see if we see a different sentiment analysis that might appear. So that's just one example of how you might use sentiment analysis to understand this aggregation of text that's being uh, put forward. Then we could look at it in another way. So we separated out the comments that came in around the mobility plan and around the bond election. And what we see is that the microblogs about the mobility plan are achievement oriented, so they express a sense of achievement that we've accomplished this thing, while the bond election is talking about real time, present time, present space, and generally expresses positive, more positive emotion than negative emotion. So if we wanted to look at this and just study what was happening in advance of a bond election, using the, uh, these microblogs coming in may give us some sense of what may happen in an actual election, that there's generally positive feelings about this bond election. So this is one more way that we could think about it. And this certainly requires more um, case studies to look and see how this works in different contexts. 
So then I looked at the actual content itself, and one of the things that we're interested in is whether or not people are simply sharing or whether they're trying to engage in some way. And so the at simple means that you're trying to direct your comment to somebody specifically. Uh, re retweet in the form of RT means that you're trying to share information that somebody's given you to a larger audience. And then including URLs generally intends that you're trying to engage someone in looking at a piece of information that you're sharing. And what we found is that 57% of the microblogs, of those 8,300 microblogs, included an at sign, meaning that they were engaging in some sort of conversation with a specific person. And 60% of them included some sort of URL. Now we also wanted to look at the analysis of sim uh, stimulation attempts. So on Facebook, the uh, SNAP had 282 pushes. So for example, earlier when we talked about the vision statement, that was an example of a push trying to encourage participation. And of those 282 Facebook pushes, 54% of them received a response, and on average they received 2.3 responses. But most important is the content analysis of completed dialogue because that's really what we wanted to have happen was completed dialogues where somebody would post something, um, SNAP would respond, and that there was an ongoing dialogue there. So SNAP made 374 attempts that I was able to document. Of those, 42% received a response. Now the question mark is any of this good or not good, where's the bar? And the question, the answer is we don't know where the bar is. That's why these studies are important is to say what should we expect. But if I was in a coffee shop and you were talking about um, the traffic on the way to get to the coffee shop and I come up behind you and I tap you on the shoulder and I say, hey, would you like to engage in a conversation about the Austin Strategic Mobility Plan since you're already talking about transportation? I don't know, maybe we'd get 40% that would respond, maybe not. So then we look at actual conversations, and I've got three examples here that I'll share with you. In this example, SNAP is trying to push out an engaging um, message that will hopefully solicit some comment back. So in this one they say, okay Austin, Nashville has you beat again, an amazing downtown transit station, and they share a um, picture and some information about this Austin transit station. So someone sees this and they respond and they say, wow, really impressive station, like that waiting room. The only downtown transit station I've been to is in Eugene, Oregon, and then they share a picture of the station that they've been to in Eugene. So SNAP responds back, we admit it looks good and sounds good. Have you ever been there to experience it in person? If so, how was it? And the, the person responds back, yeah. Then they change the topic a little bit and say, Congress Avenue acts as a transit mall of sorts, though. Is this BRT, the Metro Rapid, or something different? So now they're asking a question about the mobility plan and as it relates to rail. So SNAP responds back, Austin is looking at a combination of a BRT and a streetcar for the 2012 Urban Rail Project, but no mention of a great station like Tennessee. So the microblogger responds back with uh, two questions. One, they say, and the latest on urban rail, is the streetcar going to be at grade, mixed traffic like Portland, or some other kind of separation? And then they go on to say, Tacoma's light rapid transit is an example of what I mean by slight grade separation. And so SNAP responds back, check out all the details on the Austin Urban Rail Project here at the austinstrategicmobility.com website. So what I'll say about this is that it is very difficult to try to communicate in 140 characters or less, but the SNAP facilitators try to be as effective as possible as framing their questions and their responses so that they're short, understandable, and connect with people. And the microbloggers who are out there tweeting all the time, they're familiar with how to do this, and they're effective in communicating their messages in using abbreviations and other things that help to get to a point that you can have an interaction like this. Now, this is the example from earlier that I pointed to with Cat's Head 42. So in this case, this is a microblogger who has initiated a conversation by saying, seriously, the bus system in Austin needs major work. Snap then sees this through their scraping of the internet. They find this and they respond back. And they say, what about Austin's bus system isn't working for you now? How could it be made better? The microblogger responds, my bus was 15 minutes early, so I had to wait at the stop for an hour for the next one to come. They drive by stops all the time. So SNAP responds, it sounds like more frequent buses might help ease the pain if you miss a bus that's running early. Yes? Anything else? They respond back, that would help too. If the buses ran later into the night or early in the morning, that would help too.
Snap responds, excellent. Voicing your opinion about problems and solutions is the best way to make change happen. We hear you. So what we see is a complete conversation there in a short period of time with the tweets going back and forth, and that Snap is able to solicit this information on what the particular bus problem was in this case. I also want to talk about the importance of understanding the local culture to be able to understand the cultural references that people are making. So in this example, we have a microblogger that is having a conversation with a specific person, and they say, when I was there, I saw a guy with a ZZ Top beard pulling a stand-up bass on a trailer behind his bike. Austin equals weird biking. So Snap responds and says, do the weird Austin bikers make you want to ride a bike yourself, or are you just happy to observe? And the microblogger responds, it depends on whether I have to ride the bike in a G-string toting a stand-up bass. And Snap says, nope, you can ride the bike in any manner you choose, no G-string or instrument hauling required. In this case, uh, this Austin has a very famous biker who only rides around in his G-string, so he's kind of this public spectacle and people talk about him, and he's just part of the weirdness of Austin that people celebrate. So it was important for the facilitator to understand these cultural references so they could effectively engage in a conversation. The last thing that I wanted to look at was you know, we hear the message from our elected leaders, from our planners and others, it's always the same folks participating. So were we actually engaging a broader group of people? Were, were, is anybody dominating the conversation? So if we're hearing that tra traffic is the number one issue, is that really just the issue of one or two people, or is it the issue of the broader whole? And so through this participation process, we were able to identify the specific usernames associated with 4,439 people that, that participated by putting in these microblogs. And what we find is that the vast majority of the messages are coming from users who are only posting one time or they're posting two to five of these microblogs. We only have two people that are very heavy users. So what this means is that we have a large portion of the messages coming from a large portion of the people, meaning that we're experiencing a fairly good equality of participation in the process. And the fact that SNAP was able to engage, you know, have participation from 4,400 people in a period of six months is pretty impressive. So in the end, did it all work? And what do we take away from this? So I'll say yes, it exceeded all past project measures based on what's out there in the literature. They were able to get 200 Facebook fans in a period of just six months, which is far greater than what we've seen in a lot of fa uh, publicly oriented Facebook projects. They had 366 Twitter followers, which is far more than the vast pr uh, portion of Twitter users. They were able to generate 45 retweets per week. So this means that the messages that they were pushing out were then being shared and reaching out to a much larger audience. And 98% of the microbloggers contributed 82% of all the relevant microblogs. So this says, you know, there was equality in participation. At the same time, I'm also going to say no. It was a failure because it failed to influence decision making in the end as part of the strategic mobility planning process and in the bond election. And in talking to the city about why there were there were problems in getting the data to them in ways that they could then use, they said, you know, the city perceived a need to oversee composing messages and wanted to require message approval, but they understood that this is counterproductive to the effective use of social media. There's no way if you're engaging in the middle of the night that you're going to be able to get approval from the city on those individual messages. And the city was particularly concerned about the pushes because the whole point is to find something engaging to get people talking about. And the city was worried whether or not there was bias in what the facilitators were pushing out. The city recognized the usefulness of facilitation, but they would have preferred that their staff be able to do it themselves rather than relying on the Texas Citizens Fund to provide that staffing. And, but they recognized at the same time they didn't have staff available and the resources to allocate for facilitation, so that was a concern. The city didn't have any policies for the use of social media in microblogging, informal or formal information sources, so they were all just kind of working their way through it, and so there was a lot of tension and concern around what was happening. And the city remained concerned about who participates. So while we could tell them, hey, you had more than 4,400 people that participated, they wanted to know who those specific people are. And they were concerned that the avatars of, of these people might not, they might not be reflecting their real views, or that these views may not represent the public as a whole. And so they had some real concerns about that.
In addition, there was the issue of time lag. So it took a lot of time for SNAP to analyze all of these microblogs and then to pr provide these monthly reports. Uh, there was concern on the part of the city. They really liked the sentiment analysis, but they wanted to understand the stories behind the microblogs. And that would have required a lot more time and energy to generate that. And at the time, SNAP didn't have the analytical tools that could potentially help them in telling those stories more effectively. And generally, the public officials didn't fully understand or trust social media and what it could provide as part of the process. So there was a resistance to actually using the public input that was received because they didn't fully understand it. So there did definitely needed to be much more training and discussion in advance of the launch of the project to make sure everybody was on the same page about how this data could be used. So looking forward, uh, we have rapidly evolving technology. Our social media tools are getting better and better. Our planners need to get on board to understand how we can best use um, this type of tool in supporting our participatory processes. And the social media methods need to complement our traditional methods, and public officials need to understand what social media can and can't deliver. Now, while in this process I, I tried some different experimental methods that might help to analyze this data, there's definitely more work that needs to be done. And so that's an area that needs further work as well, to, to work on additional rise of analytical tools. And there's increasing adoption of technology, and minorities in particular are adopting social media in greater portions than the population as a whole. And at the same time, our leaders are increasingly becoming technology savvy. So the digital divide is certainly an issue, uh, but when in concert with other targeted outreach activities, social media can contribute to a comprehensive outreach and engagement effort. So I think this really points to what Rob's going to be talking about next, is the representativeness of the input that's being received, and how much can we trust that? How can we understand and interpret that to uh, create meaningful input in our planning process? So at this point, I just would say that it's obvious from going through this process that planners need more training on how to microblog for engagement. And they need to not only understand how to use social media, but how to analyze it and use it to persuade public officials of its legitimacy. So at this point, I'm going to be turning it over to Rob, and he is going to be talking to you about the process in Austin. Rob, let me change presenters. Okay, all right, Rob, it's Jennifer. all yours, thanks. Okay, great, thank you. So I've titled my um, brief remarks today here, The Dilemma of Online Participation, and I will explain uh, in a minute exactly what I have in mind by that. So just a brief overview first is an, um, an orientation to the process that I was studying, which was also in Austin. Um, second is my results um, for three research questions, and then finally, some conclusions and recommendations for practice. So to begin, I really looked um, and uh, oriented my study um, using two types of theory. And the first um, was uh, I asked, what is the purpose of participation in planning? I think the most um, widely known article about this is Sherry Arnstein's Ladder of Participation. Um, and she really says two things. One is that uh, participation can be manipulative, so she, we should be careful. And the other is she's writing in the 60s, the more power you can delegate, the better. And I think this um, has been very influential in the field, um, but uh, really needed to be updated for a more modern view. And so um, I found um, a framework that worked for me by Archon Fung, and he identified three failures of uh, representative democracy that participation can help ameliorate. The first is legitimacy. Often planning is concerning uh, topics which we're not sure our elected representatives know much about. The second is effectiveness. And so presumably you can get ideas and um, create policy that's really tuned to the local context. And then finally, there's an assumption of that participation may be uh, help achieve um, justice, in particular if um, you're engaging communities that don't have um, good working relationships with government uh, entities or officials. And I'll just say this is a very kind of specific um, framework that I uh, took, um, but there are other 
uh, ways of looking at it. I think Jennifer suggests some of them. Um, some researchers are very interested in the individual participant outcomes of learning and empowerment, and there are other ways of looking at it about the empowerment of communities. The other approach I took looking at participation was finding theories that could explain why people are motivated to participate to begin with. The most clear relationship in the literature is that it's linked to socioeconomic status, such as income and education, um, but I don't think that's really very useful um, for planners. And so I identified uh, two studies that try to go a bit deeper and identify some of the causal factors that um, can help us understand this. And so so I'll uh, discuss these a little bit more later. Uh, but you can see right away, uh, for example, the first theory is the civic volunteerism model says that some of the factors involved are how much information the citizen has about what's going on, uh, whether or not they're recruited by a friend or um, a community leader, and other factors. And similarly, the 1996 study uh, goes into detail about, we know that it, education is important. What are some of the skills or attitudes um, that it may actually impart? And I think, uh, in my conclusion, I'll circle back, we can use this to craft participation methods that are um, more inclusive and motivate um, larger numbers and more representative um, people to participate. This is the general framework of the study, and really, uh, I was sensitive to kind of two things, that citizens are involved in the creation of the plan, uh, the comprehensive plan, the topics themselves are up for grabs. Second, they actually can, uh, theoretically should be able to provide input into the specific proposals or vision that's, uh, that's described in the plan. And then finally, there is a relationship. The city council um, approves the document, and so there's a formal relationship through voting, as well as city council members uh, polling and uh, informally discussing with citizens. So um, in all three of these, um, I identified on the left a um, series of what I call participation approaches. These are things the city was doing to enable these links to happen. And so for the purposes of the study, um, these were the final approaches. And so you can see I'm looking at online in the context of um, all of the activities that are taking place. In particular, I look at a Facebook page. Um, it's not on the slide, but also their use of Twitter, a online survey using SurveyMonkey, a website that has comments. And then you can see there's a variety of other um, exercises as well as formal community meetings that were happening at this time. And just to briefly explain, um, this research um, was done over a period of about one one year, and, but it was the early phase of the comprehensive planning process. So actually right now they've um, proceeded on to, I think they're near three or they may be approaching four where the city council will be considering um, the final proposal. I think they're refining the vision. And so some of my conclusions, as you'll see, are colored by the fact that in this phase of the process, they were really looking to generate vision and to get many ideas on the table. And so some of what I'll say um, may be amended if you're looking at participation at various points in a complex uh, planning process, um, similar to ones you may be familiar with in your own practice or here, as we see in Austin. And so finally, what is this dilemma? And I think the dilemma is this, that we know that large numbers of people are using digital tools, and we have an intuitive sense that it's a great way to get in touch with people, but um, we have a lurking suspicion that um, it might actually empower the wrong people. And um, really, I think it's a fear of uncertainty um, that Jennifer was talking about. We're not sure um, how representative they are in various ways of the citizens, and unlike a public meeting, um, it's a mediated form of communication. So the whole person isn't there um, for you to really get a sense of where they're from and what views they have. You can see just the raw numbers of participants that even in a short period of time, the number of people they reached through online mediums um, was much higher than the number of public meetings. And these meetings were highly publicized and um, very professionally uh, run meetings, uh, but I think this uh, kind of general pattern you could see might be similar to um, what could be possible in your city or town. And then just briefly, um, the research here, I did a participant survey of some of the most active um, participants. Um, I went to Austin and observed some of the meetings as well as analyzing the content. And so the planners there did a great job of capturing um, a lot of the input that was received in the various meetings, um, minutes 
and um, other things. And so you could get a sense of the, the content that was being received. And of course, some um, interviews of the planners as well as um, participants to get a sense of kind of on the ground how it was unfolding. And so um, I'll briefly introduce, I have three questions. The first, and you can see these relate to the, the theories I chose. Um, really, if one of the purposes of participation was to um, get views and the local knowledge and ideas of citizens, um, how open were these different mechanisms? And so, for example, um, as Jennifer was showing, you can use Twitter for um, listening and engaging in a conversation. You can also use it just to promote yourself and spread information. The second was how representative, and I found um, in two ways I'm, in, I'm interested. I think the first is the most evident in terms of age, race, ethnicity, the demographic factors. Um, the second is a little more nuanced. It says um, looking at the views of the people there, uh, they may look slightly different than the city at large, but um, really what we sh maybe should be more interested in is are their views systematically different than the city at large. And then finally, kind of a meta issue is, was the input they were receiving through these channels um, relevant to what's actually going to be in the plan? And so we saw uh, in the Twitter examples the dialogue where they can sort of explain um, the issues or the specific, provide links to kind of the specific specifics of what's proposed. Um, but in this content context, the topics and scope of a plan I don't think is necessarily self-evident to all citizens. And so I'll, I'll quickly go through some of the results. Uh, so first, um, in terms of online participation, um, really the only one that was used to receive input was the online survey. And although the city was engaging in these other methods, they would frequently tell people, you know, we're not actually recording this. You need to come to a public meeting in person. And so you can see the brief excerpt from Facebook below. And I identified several reasons this was, as Jennifer pointed out, that at, the, at this time, which is slightly before her study, they were developing a social media policy. Um, also, the social media outreach was being conducted by sub health consultants uh, who were marketing consultants. So um, the uh, planners were kind of removed by another layer from um, the people actually doing this. And I, I don't think it's a critique, but it's something to think about to be very clear uh, with how you want to engage in using these tools and what the assumptions and practices of the professionals actually using it will be. And then finally, there's just some sheer technical barriers. Um, the Imagine Austin website was the first blog the city hosted on their own website and the first to have comments. And so they had to go through a process of modifying their content management system, creating this policy, trading various staff, um, and which they went through, but it meant that there was a delay and some usability problems in, uh, early on. And uh, really, I think the, uh, this in, it was an interesting conclusion. The uh, city deliberately chose um, to say that these online forms were experimental and would be distinct from what they termed the formal opportunities of participation, which are the public meetings and steering committees and workshops. And so I think this is a very understandable and um, good starting point. Um, and I think the idea of the conversation today is to figure out what we know, what we might want to know before we can treat these experimental online tools as um, quote unquote formal uh, approaches to receiving additional forms of participation. And next I turn to this um, issue of representativeness. And so um, my survey had a size of 60, 65. Um, I didn't do statistical testing because it wasn't a random survey. Again, it was a survey of the very, very highly active online participants. Um, but my take home, and I have a complete table in, in the full, full paper, um, my conclusion from this is, you know, first that the demographic representativeness of public meetings, the conventional public meetings, um, is what I think our intuition says. It's not, we're not quite reaching um, people that look like the city. And I have the American Community Survey here as a benchmark. Um, the other conclusion is, surprisingly, the online participants were fairly similar and might even be slightly better in terms of these um, demographic indicators. It's in particular, um, there's actually more elderly and more um, more youth uh, may be online, uh, or they could be kind of kind of similar statistically. Uh, but it gives you a sense that um, 
our kind of suspicion is is on, but a long survey, uh, a long list of literature I found has basically proven that um, unless you do something radically different, a kind of conventional meeting in the school um, is not really going to reach you know, exactly a statistical picture of the city. And I don't think this is a big surprise. The next factor I looked at is uh, a little bit more nuanced is the issue of view representation. And so um, the city, as part of the process, uh, conducted a statistically significant survey, um, which they had a polling firm send out a mail survey, and they had a sample size, and they had a sampling plan that would ensure that they, re they got it to all neighborhoods and all types of people in the city. And I took one of the questions about what people's priorities were for the plan, and I asked it only to my 73 extremely active online participators. And um, I find there's kind of two take-homes for this chart. Um, the first is that the highest priority is actually very similar between the two groups. And um, the black bar represents the margin of error for the city survey. And so transportation is clearly number one. And in fact, many of these, uh, my group, which is not representative de demographically and highly self-selecting, uh, is within the margin of error to have similar views as a very carefully done citywide survey. Uh, however, and it's an important however, there's two caveats I found um, where the groups differ widely and they're well outside of the margin of error. The first was the um, city has a large rated developing health and human service facilities, homeless shelters uh, much higher than the participators. And um, the second is developing public safety facilities, police and fire also rated higher. And so uh, I think this follows some of, um, earlier research done by Tim Beatley in the 1980s in Austin that found the view representation um, differs, but in uh, kind of slight ways. It's not a wholesale, radically different um, profile. That maybe on certain issues, um, such as the role of government, kind of the relative emphasis of these um, kind of core services over other things like open space may differ subtly. Um, but I think this is a really interesting uh, initial take that um, hopefully we can follow up and look in more detail um, kind of uh, and, be, and be able to attune these different mechanisms um, even better. And then finally and most briefly is the question of relevance. Um, I observe the uh, comprehensive plan as it is in most places is legally mandated to contain 10 different elements. The city council through an iterative dialogue with the steering committee added four more. However, these elements and topics were um, often not communicated to uh, participants in either the survey or the take home exercise or even in the public meetings. And instead they ask for um, kind of a SWOT analysis strength weaknesses and ideas for the future. Um, the online um, channels like Facebook and Twitter covered a wide range of topics, um, land use, transportation, and others. Um, and I think this uh, is an important trade-off to consider and be very strategic about. On the one hand, we, I think, want to be extremely open-ended with these comprehensive plans to encourage creativity and to encourage citizens to guide the topics through their responses. Uh, on the other, uh, the plan does have some elements which it will include, and unless people know about it, um, they may or may not know to give their view or ideas about it. So for example, it's definitely going to have um, transportation, land use, what's the overall pattern of growth, and ensuring that's communicated at the point where the first hearing about it um, may be important so that they um, know to kind of cover that in, in what they're giving you. And so I, uh, from this, drew some conclusions that I'm looking forward to discussing with the group. Um, and really the first is that in some sense this dilemma is real. Um, there are these slight and subtle differences. Um, however, I think more importantly, um, we really have to be very uh, specific about what our goals are. So for example, if you're looking for the views or local ideas in a neighborhood, um, I think really what you should have in mind is smarter participation and not necessarily um, maximizing the numbers. Um, so in that case, you may want to have fewer, more goal-directed approaches where it's clear to the citizen and to the, uh, the um, consultants or government officials operating it exactly what the, the purpose is. Is this looking for new ideas? Are we uh, kind of rank sites for new parks? Or is this a very open-ended br brainstorming? And um, secondly, I think there's uh, 
and it, always a desire to promote planning and to promote these processes in general. Um, and a broadcast approach can work, but as you saw earlier in the example of the dialogue on Facebook, it wasn't clear to me citizens are making these nuanced distinctions between, yes, the, the online survey is actually real, but if I post a comment on Facebook, um, it's not being listened to. And that's putting a lot of burden on them to sort of know and, and choose how they're going to engage. Um, and also, right, you know, requiring people to come to public meetings can have a real high, real cost in terms of time, childcare, and transportation. And uh, we should maybe think twice about um, requiring that as the only formal mechanism and think about in what ways can we open up some of these online channels um, in ways that are we're comfortable to us as well as um, the citizens at large. Uh, the second had to do with looking at these different approaches as really a wide constellation that people were, um, in my survey, that the most active people are going to engage in multiple ways. And we need to uh, treat this very deliberately up front. And so what the chart shows is the percent of these active participants who I surveyed who said that they had done each activity. And so almost 20% um, had done almost all of them. And um, the next slide will show in more detail. And so I think uh, we sometimes add more and more channels, um, not, real, not thinking kind of critically about is this truly going to reach new communities, or is this truly giving me additional value in terms of what it can tell me and how it can improve the plan? Um, or is it ca causing more work and more opportunities, but um, for the same people to kind of engage in different ways? Um, this visualization um, represents the number of people who overlap between each of the um, approaches in my study. And so I think uh, it kind of suggests some hypothesis to me that I'd like to follow up. I mean, uh, intuitively it seems correct that the website is a gateway in one of two ways. It's either a place to, of initial contact, they sort of Google something or um, seek it out for some reason. Um, in communications theory, there's a notion of mobilizing information, um, which is things like um, directions for how to participate in surveys, um, the dates and times of public meetings, dates and times of, of steering meetings or other meetings you can attend. And so clearly that kind of information, the planners are very good at putting on the website. The second way of interpreting this is that uh, the initial point of contact may be one of these others, um, but in, as in the case with Jennifer, they're being referred or linking back to the website to get more context and to find out um, what other opportunities are. So they're kind of bouncing around between them. And I think um, we don't think as deliberately about what the overall system we're creating is and tend to view each of them as an individual self-contained entity. So this just might suggest that um, the world is complex and people have kind of many different um, preferences and many different channels that they may be working with. And finally, um, some recommendations. And so I have recommendations for each of the three uh, research questions. The first um, concerns openness. And so uh, really it's uh, to be open to the idea of using these channels and to be very deliberate on both ends about where, uh, what's being asked for and um, what's being recorded. And so I think um, there's some fuzziness, you know, what are your hopes, dreams, and ideas, um, and, and those could be refined further and saying, you know, in this case we're looking for uh, ideas on this topic, uh, we're looking for a general spatial strategy for the city, and um, that potentially this could mean that actually doing fewer channels um, but picking only a few may give you the human resources to actually listen and engage in a more um, detailed way. Secondly is um, representation, and so this comes back to the theories that I identified. Um, really the case actually contained two really inspiring um, stories, and the city conducted two outreach meetings, one at the Asian American Community Center and one at the Mexican American Community Center, which were highly successful. A photo of the former is below. And I think this confirms some of the sociologists who are telling us that, yes, participation is loosely correlated with things like income and education, but if we look at a more nuanced way, the principles of community organizing are successful because they do things like recruit people, they work through existing social networks or community or cultural networks, and 
um, if, if you locate them in the right places in the right ways, you can minimize the resources required. Um, uh, another major conclusion of my paper um, has to do with the issue of language. Um, and um, it's self-evident, but bears repeating, to be very attentive to the languages spoken in the target communities and ensure that your online and offline channels, if you want to reach those language communities, are, um, are doing it in the right way. And this in, in certainly requires expense and complications that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but it's um, you're really a very critical piece that we can't omit in our enthusiasm to look at new tools. And finally, kind of very briefly here, this issue of relevance, and I, I, I keep it brief because I think it's debatable. Um, maybe it's an acceptable trade-off to be extremely ambiguous at the early phase and then zero in as the, as the process moves along. Um, however, you know, I've kind of taken the position that uh, being too broad can be demotivating in some sense, and we need to be actively providing some context. It's a very complicated, busy world out there. Um, not everyone is that familiar with planning, and uh, when we're going to be most successful, we'll be talking to those people, and it's very useful to kind of communicate clearly and succinctly about exactly the content of the plans and policies that we're formulating. And then as a, a final slide here, um, I think kind of what the future holds is um, tools and practices you may be familiar with, and we may, we've seen some a little bit in the case today where um, the online engagement is really narrowly and clearly linked to an intended purpose. And so um, one example, the future Melbourne project was really oriented around getting creative, um, good ideas for new policies for the city of Melbourne, Australia. And so it was about creating a wiki and a document. Um, they did look at issues of representation, but it was much more about trying to generate from the ground up what are some of the policies or ideas about um, designing the city that um, could be done. And some of these others you may have some exposure to. Um, they're similarly linked to kind of discrete um, uh, purposes for participation. I think the final one to just mention is that at the federal level, uh, many federal agencies have been experimenting with um, idea ranking systems like U user voice. Uh, they have a drawback like Twitter. They're very narrow bandwidth. You kind of enter a short statement. Um, but the advantage is if what you're trying to do is generate ideas and rank them on a very focused question or topic area, um, it's provides an online framework where uh, you can enable people to contribute ideas and vote to interact, um, but come up with an outcome that's easily understandable and has been sort of sifted and filtered into a way that can be plugged into the process. And uh, these slides are um, posted online, so if you'd like to follow up on these citations, um, you can also contact me. Um, and I think we're um, uh, going to open it up for questions here and um, use the remainder of the time to begin to discuss some of the issues. Okay, great. Well, we've got a whole slew of questions that have come in from our participants. So, Rob, I have a good one that you can probably answer right away. So, Ru uh, Rupin wants to know, are there any good precedents out there for municipalities looking to develop social media policies, um, cities that have done a good job in terms of creating a staff usage policy, policy that provides staff with sufficient access to these tools to engage stakeholders without creating too many limits or restrictions? Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I've, he I've heard about many of these. Um, I actually think um, this is something that um, I'd like to take a few minutes and kind of pull together the ones I'm aware of, and then maybe um, I can, um, Jennifer, we could circulate it to, to the group, because it is an area that's been kind of in rapid development. Um, I've cited the one in Austin, which um, I, I'm, uh, I think is public and I can share, um, but uh, I'll do a, a, some review about others. Um, we, I mean, it's a also, kind of the caution is um, uh, finding policies from other cities um, is a great starting point, but ultimately the best policy might be tuned to the skills and um, temperament of your own office in your own city. Okay, great. Um, Rob, can you post that last slide for everybody to look at that has the contact information on it? And I just see oh, that uh, someone has just um, given us the social media policy for Austin, and I'm going to post that to the entire audience via the chat. So that's available great. for everybody. Okay, so we uh, next question will... Uh, 
Okay, has there been any concern about skewed sampling coming from Twitter users, and this is in the case of, of SNAP, but I think you, you could answer this as well, Rob, about the skew uh, of participants coming from the social media sites in your comprehensive planning process. I'll just respond from the perspective. Uh, the city was just very apprehensive generally from the transportation end of things in not understanding who was specifically participating because you couldn't give them complete demographics on who these participants were. We do know that Austin's social media usage is higher than the national rates but that we understand that Twitter users are not representative of the population as a whole, and that's why a comprehensive participatory process is so important, is to recognize that the online social media participating patient you're getting is just one piece of that puzzle. So it was definitely a concern and I think we need to work to develop better ways to communicate about what social media can deliver in terms of some of those demographics as a whole. Uh, Rob, do you want to comment on that? Um, yeah, really kind of two, two issues. Um, many of you may be familiar with the work done by the Pew Internet and American Life Project. It's a, a ongoing survey project to really understand how not just the internet but also these new channels are being used. And so they have excellent longitudinal data about um, various things and they do special surveys. Um, you have to be, when using that data to kind of figure out who's on what platform, be very cognizant of the precise question asked. Um, and there's a, a huge gradation between somebody who has, a, has an account and signed up once and somebody who uses it every day. And so um, that's, that's kind of a resource. I think really um, this also points to um, the issue of the digital divide, which we don't talk about so much anymore. And I think it's because uh, the world is getting more complicated. Um, I like to think about it in terms of three, three kind of key factors. Um, the first is the um, literally the hardware, um, you know, how, what percentage of people are using smartphones or have high bandwidth connections if the channels you're using requires that. The second is the issue of usability. Uh, many, um, the, how much participation you're going to get is a factor of how um, well designed your survey is, well designed your website is, and um, in terms of things like Twitter is um, whether you're engaging with the norms of, of use that the community are using. But then finally, and this is the, the kind of killer factor for planners, is uh, motivation is hugely important. I think what we've learned is uh, communities which on the other two, um, is, you know, they don't really have necessarily the, the, the most excellent uh, hardware or the systems they're using are, poor, are kind of clunky and poorly designed, but if you're highly motivated, um, you are willing to, to shoulder the burden of figuring it out and going through that. And so uh, because of these three factors, um, it's very hard to predict and we should also treat statistics with a grain of salt because for any given process, um, the way they did usability, uh, how um, in this case, the Austin website is very good, but plenty of city websites load very slowly or don't work well in different browsers, and th that will affect the uh, numbers you get in the end. And so um, that's, I think, a, a thought about that. Okay, and Rob, I'll just add, I just saw a statistic that came out based on fourth quarter 2010 sales of smartphones that 20% mm -hmm. of Americans now have a smartphone, and that's a rapidly rising number, but about one in five. I, I heard an estimate by the end of this year, it's it's going to be over 50%. But um, so a, a, anyway, it's they're certainly spreading very widely. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, there was just a quick question for you, Rob, about what a meeting in a box is. <laughs> uh, that was it's a really creative approach. Um, some of the faculty at the University of Texas um, uh, uh, dreamt it up. Um, the idea is it's a structured um, dialogue. Uh, and basically, if someone, an individual, is um, really motivated to engage with their family, their neighborhood, their community group, um, they can pick up um, a set of materials that has a script and uh, guides you through some exercises. Um, and it's oriented towards generating lists and information about the strengths, weaknesses, and ideas for the future for the city. This was part of the visioning phase. And then the idea is you record um, how your meeting went, and then you can turn it back into the city, and then they aggregate all these different meetings into boxes. Um, so it's uh, very low-tech, but I think it has kind of, kind of an, a high-tech attitude um, where it's much more seeking ways of engaging people, um, in, not just in the meeting that we're going to pick the time, but the one that works for your community. So. Um, I didn't, in the paper I discussed it a little more, um, I didn't 
uh, analyze that kind of exclusively, um, but certainly an example of um, a more innovative offline approach that um, we could consider. Okay, great. We've got a couple of related comments that I think relate to both of our studies. So one, how do you notify respondents that their data is being collected, analyzed, and likely saved for public records? And then the flip side of that, uh, and I think this probably relates a little more to my study, is did people feel like their privacy was being invaded? So Rob, I'll let you start with that and then I'll follow up. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, I didn't look at this specifically, you know, as I said in the presentation, you know, my assumption is many citizens are assuming when they talk to a government that the government's listening and to presumably to listen you have to re record and, and, and do all that. Um, certainly on the online survey they very explicitly uh, had a policy saying, you know, yes we're recording this and um, explain the privacy issues. Um, but, you know, kind of to that extent, um, certainly the paradigm at the federal level has been that if you want to have write in and comment on a regulation, it's um, it becomes a public record and it's it's pretty widely known. But I think that's a really uh, important question that as we drill down to lower levels or community-based processes, to be really explicit and clear with participants um, about that and uh, about the whether um, different things are subject to either freedom of information laws or also um, public meeting laws. Okay, great. And I would add. The SNAP website explained, you know, pretty clearly in simple language that this information was being collected and given to the city. Out of the thousands of people who participated, only one person raised a concern, and uh, they posted some kind of hate messages uh, via Twitter telling people uh, that Austin is, you know, invading their privacy. But it really they weren't because they didn't have their privacy settings set up so that it was blocking the city from being able to view it. And I think the important point here is the difference between open and closed social networks. So an open social network is Twitter. Unless you specifically set up your privacy settings to block people from being able to see it, then anyone can search on any topic. And it's really intended to be that way. The, the expectation on Twitter is that you may not know the people that are following you, but they're following you because they're interested in what you're saying. And then vice uh, versa, in a closed social network such as Facebook, you're only allowing people who you're friends with to be able to see what you're doing. And so the expect, the problem is most people on Twitter don't understand that distinction. And so it does come as a surprise when somebody happens to tweet them that they don't know. But of the thousands of people that participated, only one raised any concern about this issue of invasion of privacy. Okay, so the next question, one bit of the big legal questions that we are wondering is how we make sure that comments on a social media form on a current land use file is not part of the public record for the file. So this is a question from Christina. Rob, do you want to try to answer that one? <laughs> uh, you know, the, um, uh, that reminds me, I've been, I've been in conversations with other people about this, um, and I, uh, I'm actually I'm I'm actually not going to going to give an answer other than to, to say um, I think that's it's a great question it's something that that we clearly have have to work out you know in my case the channels I was looking at were very clearly in control of the city or the city's consultants and so in which case um, comments they received um, would have to be it wasn't um, uh, uh, falling on it wasn't a, a NEPA or a environmental impact. Um, kind of process, um, which have different um, requirements, but um, in, in any case, it would be clear it's part of the record, the public records related to the process. Um, but I'm I'm really not sure if there's a way of engaging online and making them exempt. And I'll just add that this is a topic that we're going to be talking about at the APA conference in two weeks. Uh, there's a session that's going to be on social media that Rob and I will be participating in. And one of the speakers is going to be there specifically talking about this issue of documentation and uh, the legal requirements related to documentation. Um, can you, Rob, pull back up that circular diagram, the wheel graphic, that showed the different connections? Uh, we have questions around how it was created and then also how to understand it. So maybe if you can go back over that quickly, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that would help George and uh, Stan and a couple of others as well. Okay, great. Um, uh, 
and and they're good questions. Um, this graphic actually uh, only includes uh, people who participated in um, more than one of these activities. Um, and in this case, I've selected six. And so what the um, links are showing is the number of people who participated in both of those activities. So for example, uh, if we start up on the website in the top right, um, you can see there's a bar going all the way over to the open house. And so um, the numbers add up to more than are in the set because if you participated in both the website and the open house, as well as the website and the meeting in a box, you would be represented as part of the greenish bar as well as the bluish bar. Um, but what I th the reason I included it and I thought it was useful um, is simply to show that essentially everything is, um, no one channel is getting kind of very unique participants in terms of these very active um, 65 online participants that are included in the survey. And so the ones that are, you know, pretty much everybody is doing is the website and the public meetings, and the others have smaller um, overlaps, um, but uh, it's a very complicated picture. and. Um, you know, any individual thing, um, you know, that there's a high chance that people are also participating in um, one or, or more of the others. Um, I think, uh, yeah, in, in, in the paper, I think it's, um, I have kind of a table that shows a little more clearly what I'm trying to show with this. Hey, wonderful. So we have a question about the large percentage of blue-collar Hispanic immigrants that cannot speak or read English, but may not also be able to read Spanish. Mm -hmm. How can social me media be used to engage these groups, and have you considered the validity of data collected in areas with high Hispanic populations? Um, so I, I can say that I know that Los Angeles has created multilingual Facebook pages so that they have them set up in both Spanish and in English so that way they can encourage the participation of their Spanish speaking population that would of course require that they do read Spanish um, so that's just one example where you have a high immigrant community where they've gone into multilingual efforts to try to engage their um, population via social media Rob I don't know if you want to add anything on that mm -hmm. um, uh, only that um there's actually a colleague here in my department is doing research on a um, voice-only platform developed by people in Los Angeles to um, engage with um, migrant laborers and day laborers. Um, and so um, that's not social media per se, but there, are, there still are ways of being creative with technology um, to work with these communities. But certainly the macroscopic trends in terms of um, widening gaps in income disparities as well as um, worsening literacy and educational outcomes um, are well documented and you have multi-decade trends in the United States. And so certainly create an increasingly difficult and socially polarized context to do planning. So, you know, I'm, I'm well aware of it and, um, you, know, you know, really think that the only uh, technical solutions will be um, things like uh, voice systems and, uh, and, and that sort of thing, but um, recognize it's, it's not a barrier that's very easy. The other comment there is I think we should understand that information moves in very unexpected and kind of fluid ways. And so systems and protocols that empower community leaders, for example, or empower um, uh, kind of key figures and educate them um, can often uh, trickle down into their communities. Um, or conversely, recruitment strategies, in my case, in the Mexican American Cultural Center um, that uh, target those communities through their existing social networks, whether it's faith organizations, um, can often be an effective strategy. And uh, none of that is very uh, techy. It's much more about organizing. But um, there are reasons those methods are so effective. And there are reasons why planners often um, start thinking that way, and um, because that really is the way um, to, to reach certain communities. OK. How do you establish sampling validity for use of social media as compared to more traditional random sampling and survey methods? Is there an inherent bias built into reliance on social media for opinion sampling? So since you actually did a survey, do you maybe want to respond to that, Rob? <laughs> uh, I did a survey, but then the, the more that I 
I kind of got, went down the rabbit hole, the less certain I was, um, you know, uh, how representative anything was. And I'll give an example. The city hired a consultant to do what they called a statistically or scientifically valid survey. But I looked at the reported um, rates of um, renters versus owners, and there's a wide discrepancy between the results of that allegedly scientific survey, which was a mail survey with phone follow-up, um, and the American Community Survey estimates. Um, and so. Uh, I immediately had concerns, you know, our, our students or uh, renters throwing these things out and um, even in a, a, a very rigid um, survey design, there's always uh, a margin of error and it may, uh, may or may not, it may actually be wider than sometimes the one that's reported given the person doing the survey. Um, there was an earlier survey um, that I cited uh, Tim Beatley and some other scholars did of the previous Austin Comprehensive Plan and they went to great lengths to make it representative. Um, but I, so I, I guess my, my, my point of view is uh, increasingly phone surveys are because um, young people and or, or all people of all ages don't have landlines or don't answer phones. Um, survey pollsters are, are realizing that any given channel is increasingly challenging. So you know if you're looking for exact uh, representativeness in terms of um, views or demographics, it's going to be uh, a challenge and you may want to spend the money to go in any one of these directions. Um, and so that's why I emphasize um, that is only kind of one dimension of the, va the valid uh, outputs of participation. All of these things are being vetted by city council, which is um, presumably accountable in some form of representative democracy. Um, so we have to figure out how we're, how we're going to balance these different needs. And was, I, Jennifer, was there another part of the question or did I answer? No, I think you got it. And I was just going to add on to that. In our example, we went back and we contacted all of those people that had been engaged with and sent them a survey link via their Twitter messaging or Facebook or whatever it might be and encouraged them to fill it out so that we could get some demographic information to understand who was participating in the process. Of course, not everyone responds, so we can't um, know for sure. And we knew going in doing that survey that we weren't going to be getting a, a sample validity. And so we recognized that going in, but we at least wanted to have some sort of survey that would tell us more about who was participating in this uh, social media process. And I agree with Rob completely. It is increasing difficult to conduct a statistically valid um, survey using any of these uh, mediums because of the lack of participation rate among different audiences using different mediums. Um, so that's certainly an issue that we still have to grapple with. So thanks Edwin for that question. Um, okay, and I guess this would go for both of us, Rob. Uh, is there anything that we know about where the users are from? So for example, a particular neighborhood or other demographics. Um, what do we know mm -hmm. in terms of who the gap is and who we're not reaching? Um, you know, really the uh, various channels, the, the kind of data the city had collected that I was analyzing um, asked for the, the neighborhood you're in. Um, they used um, relatively coarse zones of the city and so I didn't actually analyze it in a fine level of detail because um, I think their whole city was only divided into five or six and so this, the city themselves have published some um, kind of you know who, who are we reaching in our in our community forums fact sheets um, that show this geographic representation um, but each area itself was pretty heterogeneous and it it trended um, from my my recollection slightly towards um, the more affluent um, middle class neighborhoods, but that um, is, you know, it, it is expected because it's correlated with um, the demographics of the individuals, which we have data about. Um, I think uh, this is kind of an intriguing um, way because increasingly, um, especially with mobile phones, we're able to um, receive data that's being geotagged, so tweets can have um, geographic data associated with them, um, as well as um, photos and um, blog posts can have place names and things like that. And so um, that does enable, uh, given the, the, the form, uh, to know a little bit about kind of which the neighborhood variation. I think the, the large unanswered question here is uh, what about people who don't live in the city or who split their time? And um, this isn't something I've seen 
uh, narrowed in on. Um, I did see a case study of participatory budgeting in Brazil. They had a very strict registration where you actually had to be a registered voter in, in the city and then you could log in and vote through an online system for infrastructure improvements. And I think my, from my, my memory, over 10% of the people who voted, who so they had to be registered voters in, in the city, um, were voting, uh, said that they were voting from other places. And so I think that there's this broader trend of um, the uh, the traditional, you know, I live in this neighborhood my whole life is really radically shifted, and we actually have transnational migrants calling, you know, living 50, splitting their time between different different cities, 50% you know, in Manhattan, 50% in the Dominican Republic, um, to give an example. So that's that's a huge conceptual challenge for planners who are much more comfortable with the community group of homeowners than they are with um, migrants or students or uh, young young people that are much more more transient. And Rob brings up a really important point, and this was something we tried to emphasize to the city, that a lot of the transportation problems are not necessarily caused by the residents of the city of Austin specifically. They may be commuters that are coming in from another area, or they're along a major transportation corridor that people may be commuting from San Antonio to Dallas or other places. And so getting input from people who are tourists, who may be commuters, who may be other things, may be equally important in terms of understanding how to develop transportation solutions. So the place base of, of those people may not be as important as one might have liked. But in the original design, the idea was to do heat maps where we could see where the tweets were coming from, where these microblogs were coming from, so we could identify how close they are to the rail line or public transit or other things. Um, but Unfortunately, because of the bureaucratic structure and getting things approved, we weren't able to do the microsurveys as frequently as one m would have liked. And ultimately, we had to abandon the idea of being able to connect people to locations through very uh, small surveys, just asking them, what's your zip code or, you know, where do you live in some other way? Um, so we were unfortunately unable to do that, but that was part of the intention was to try to measure that in some way so that you could better understand how sentiment is associated based on where people are at. So if they're close to the rail line, are they more supportive or less supportive of rail transit or other kinds of issues? Okay. Um, we have another question about that circular graph. Uh, Rob, you didn't answer how you made it, what program oh, it was made in. Um, um, uh, I, I've forgotten the name. It, uh, it was a, a particular visualization program. Um, I, I can look that up. It, it's been uh, approximately a year since I did it, so I, I'm blanking on what, it, what it's called. Okay, but it's not in PowerPoint or anything else. It's a special program. No, for that. no, no. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so Chris wants to know, have communities, transit systems used location-based social media such as Foursquare as a tool in understanding their user base? Um, I'll respond that, Chris, I haven't seen any local governments that are using it that way. Um, I was putting together a presentation a little earlier today for an applications-based uh, conference I'm doing next week, and I was looking specifically for examples of that. There are some that are using location-based data for reporting code enforcement. Um, so, for example, the city of Boston is uh, tying their 311 system into an app that you can download, take a picture of a code enforcement problem, send it in. Uh, there examples like that, but I haven't seen anything that is more engagement-based. The transit systems, it tends to be location-based for telling you when the bus is coming, rather than the engagement that uh, we're talking about here. Rob, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, yeah, j just that in the, in the Boston case, it's a city-owned app that then uh, you can, after you've reported to their um, constituent relationship system, you can then tweet your report. Um, and so there's this kind of outward integration. Um, the, uh, the only engagement around transportation I've seen as place-based is some of the third-party apps that are reusing the real-time data have kind of um, various ways of providing a discussion channel or uh, back discussion kind of in, either in the app or through a Twitter hashtag. Um, it might be specific to a rail line um, or, or I think there's like a some of them, it's like the bus system in general, you can kind of tweet and, and other riders can go there and see what's being said. Um, uh, and then just a note about Foursquare is uh, if this group, uh, only about 20% are using Twitter, my suspicion is it's a much smaller group that are using Foursquare. Foursquare. It's really um, those kind of tools are, uh, my sense is still um, kind of very elite tools. and. Um, 
and so there's potential for creativity, but you also have to be sure that there's enough kind of a critical mass to um, do the experiment you want to try. Okay, great point. Uh, so based on the research that you've done, Rob, what methods would be most useful or applicable to determine representativeness of an online population or participants? That's from Edwin. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a great question. I think the starting point is to uh, have, a, have a critical discussion. We've talked about at least three dimensions, view representation, um, demographic representation, and, and then also geographic, which the question raised a, a couple ago. Um, uh, and so in any given process, you want to have a critical discussion of all those different dimensions. You know, wh uh, which ones are you going to prioritize? And then um, tune the process um, that way. Uh, also, uh, these, um, we've all, uh, or many of us may have seen these maps. In the spe what specific networks communities use does vary. Um, the U.S. is you know, more or less homogenous, but there are language-specific um, and especially as you go around the world, there's a, a host of each country, um, many of them have kind of uh, social networking sites that are more popular there than they are somewhere else. So that's the other factor to think, think about. Um, I think, and so, you know, if you're doing a downtown plan, it might actually be LinkedIn that you really want to spend your, your time and energy if everyone's a white collar worker and they're all on LinkedIn. Um, I think face, you know, Facebook and then kind of each of them have slightly different demographic profiles. Um, and, and you kind of think, think about that. Uh, and then, it, you know, but in relation to the, the larger issue of representation, it's, you know, linking exactly what are we concerned with, that they have unrepresentative opinions, or uh, we just want to tell our elected officials that uh, in terms of certain key demographic factors, we're reaching everyone. And then two, in your strategy. And something I saw happening in Austin that I thought was um, great advice is they literally at their steering committee meetings would pass around the latest report of who they were reaching through their meetings and outreach efforts and discussion in an open forum, you know, with who's missing and what steps can we take to bring them to the table or to ensure that they're included. And um, I think that's, that's really the best way to go about that. Great. We have uh, two people who have asked questions about how do we think about social media in a rural context? Both Megan and Patricia are saying, you know, what do we do in locations in rural areas with limited broadband and cell coverage or in areas where you just have a generally low population? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just have a, a brief comment. I think the very clear finding was the website is kind of the starting point for a lot of this. And so, um, Jennifer, I know you've done extensive research, kind of longitudinal studies of, of how planning agencies use their websites. Um, but that, uh, immediately you should evaluate it in terms of technical usability, um, the, uh, uh, according to plain, plain language or the quality and clarity of the language and information, and then begin to think about are there limited ways we can engage with people there, allow them to sign up for notices or participate in surveys. Um, I think, the, you know, and, and um, to the extent that you're going to reach people uh, where you're not sure uh, about tools, um, it seems pretty clear that that's, that's uh, the biggest for a, a tech-savvy place like Austin, and I would suspect uh, would be the, the primary way you're going to get people um, and the other thing is um, uh, you r really try to um, learn on the ground kind of what tools people are using. And if, if they're not um, using these, you may have to put, you know, be just very pragmatic about um, what's going to work. Okay, great. Our time is up. We didn't get to all the questions today, but everyone asked some really great, insightful questions, and we had some really good dialogue. I'd encourage you to take a look at our papers in more detail. There's more detail um, located on our websites. And we look forward, uh, please join us at the APA conference. If you're there, we'll have a, a very good discussion. That session is focused on being more discussion-oriented as an opportunity to go into more depth with a lot of the questions that you all are answering or asking. A recording of today's session will be available after the fact at the Utah APA website. You can um, get a recording of that there. When you leave, you will be asked to fill out a uh, survey letting us know what you thought about today's session. We appreciate your feedback. It certainly helps us as we move forward in programming future sessions. So thank you, Rob, for joining us today, and thanks to our audience for your insightful um, comments. All right, thank you. Okay, so Rob, you can go ahead and log off. I'll just gather a few of the questions and then um, I'll communicate with you by email. Okay, sounds great. Thanks. All right, Jennifer. thanks.